とグローバルスタディ研究家のキャンベルと申します。よろしくお願いします。あの本日はえっ、ー、と多分なんか三人ぐらい。来てくださるかなと思ってしまったのでもうちょっとしっかり準備したらよかったのにと思うんですけれどもえっ、ー、とまあ原則としてはこちらの発表は英語でさせていただきますけれども内容的には簡単に日本語で言っておいてそしてもう質問がある時にはまあ混ぜても日本語でも英語でもまあ,まあ,あの行いたいと思います。えーとまあ、一番あのこちらの発表の中では一番興味あるのがやっぱりあの福音派の人たちがトランプ大統領がもうすごく応援したんです数字を出ると 81% がトランプを応援しましたそれがジョージ・ブッシュジョージ・ W ・ブッシュより多いムケインより多いそしてあのロムニーより多いその3人の中でももうクリスチャンがもう絶対そうと思うんですけれどもトランプはどうかと思ってしまうんですけれどもなぜその 81% が応援してるのかとちょっと不思議な感じだと思うんですただしその数字を見るとまあ全ての,あのイヴァンジェリカル・クリスチャンのコミュニティが分かるわけではありません。今日の発表はその 81% がすごく目立っているの数字ですがその中ではいろんな歯がありますいろんな批判もありますだからそのクリスチャンのイベンジェルコの中ではいろんな動きがあるんですいろんな政治活動もされている政治運動されている全員がトランプを応援しているわけではないんですけれどもでもクリントンとトランプを選べるときにはやっぱりまあしょうがないトランプに選べれたんですけれども今日の発表ではその中ではそのコミュニティの中ではいろんな派がありますそれは紹介させていただきますもちろんあのその福音派の中ではそのなんかビ,ビッグフォーっていうんですけれどもそういうあのすごく重要なことであのみんなが合意できているのが一つはやっぱり中絶はダメですそれがもうほとんどどんな人でもそれがダメです。そして同性結婚のこともすごく批判されてますが、えー、と数年前にあの少し前にアメリカの最高裁判所で認められるべきです。全国です。だからそれは負けてしまうんです。ただそれが次のステップはその LGBTQ の人権。のことをすすごく運動がされてますだから今日の話はなんか全体のナショナルレベル全体のアメリカに活動されていることなんですけれどもそれよりも重要なことが州によって州によっていろんな活動がありますいろんな政治運動があります。今日は全体アメリカあのあの考えますけれども特にそういう LGBTQ のことが州によることがそれぞれあります。それが二つ。次はその最高裁判所。すごく重要なことで、そして四つのが最近出てきたんです。それが信教の自由。なぜっていうか、信教の自由がアメリカ歴史がとっても長いと思われるかもしれないんですけれども。そのイヴァンジェルカ派の中では。あの最高裁判所が同性結婚を認められるべきだと判断された時にはじゃあもしあのそのあの政府たちがあの自分の教会でこの人たちを結婚しなさいと言われるかもしれないだからすごく心配されているだからそれが信仰の自由のことがあのすごく中心になりました。そのの4件のことが大体どんな派でもどんな人でもイヴァンジェルカの中では合意ができますそれが確かにそうですただみんながそれだったらトランプを応援しているわけではありませんだから今日の発表ではそれがあの私の言った話がちょっと別においてそこからがじゃあその中ではどんなことがありますどんなことを行ってますかと。えー、っと
ゃあ,あの難しいですけれどもと申し訳ないですけれどもちょっと英語でさせていただいてあの、まあ、ちょくちょくあの日本語も使いさせていただいて、えー、そしてあの今日いっぱいあのパワーポイントのスライドを用意してそして動画もあります。ちょっとまあ、分からなくても綺麗な写真を見てください。<笑> All right. So, what is striking about Donald Trump and the religious community is that he is without question the most irreligious president we have ever had in the United States. He's a casino owner, a sexual harasser, and he's been married three times. He tried during the presidential election to appear to be very pious by appointing as his vice president Mike Pence, who very proudly would announce himself every time I'm a Christian, I'm a conservative, and I'm a Republican, and in that order. So he made it clear that he was a Christian first. He was born as an evangelical, but converted to Catholicism because of his wife. Trump also bathed in the support of Jerry Falwell Jr., whose name you may recognize because of his famous father, Jerry Falwell, the leader of the moral majority in the 1980s in the Reagan years. And his son is president of the world's largest Christian university, Liberty University in Lynchburg, Virginia, who came out very strongly in favor of Donald Trump. So, Trump did his best to reach out to evangelical voters, but unfortunately for him, he revealed a profound ignorance of Christianity.、Uh, he proudly waved a Bible his mother gave him in 1955 after he graduated from his church primary school, but he, when asked, he could not name his favorite book in the Bible or even locate a single verse that he thought was inspiring. It's an incredible book. So many things you can learn from the Bible, he said. The Bible means a lot to me. That was all we could get out of him. He refused to and probably could not say any more. He famously, at Liberty University, no less, mispronounced 2 Corinthians as 2 Corinthians and described communion as his, quote, little wine and little cracker. He was asked at an evangelical forum if he had ever sought God's forgiveness. And he said, I'm not sure I have ever asked God's forgiveness. I don't bring God into that picture. In fact, he made himself an easy target for left leaning Christians and non Christians to make fun of him, such as these internet memes Look at me, everybody, I'm a Christian. Howdy, howdy, howdy. American evangelicals' favorite strip club owner. And what kind of people praise a man who pretends to be a Christian and degrade a man who truly is one? On the bottom is former President Jimmy Carter, also an evangelical Christian, but not one embraced by the conservative evangelical community, but who has spent his life after being president building houses for Habitat for Humanity, and so for some is a kind of example of true evangelical Christianity. After he won the Republican nomination, Donald Trump said he thanked the evangelical religious community and said, I'm not sure I totally deserve it. But support him, they did. 81% of white evangelicals voted for Donald Trump. That's more than voted for John McCain, 74%, Mitt Romney, 78%, or George W. Bush, 78%. Barack Obama, who an alarming number of Americans thought was a secret Muslim, had an extraordinary gift for scripture and Christian doctrine. But in 2012, he received 21% of the white evangelical vote. Four years later, it was down to 16%. Hillary Clinton tried to demonstrate her Methodist upbringing, but it made no difference whatsoever. And she chose as her running mate Tim Kaine, who had served as a Catholic missionary to the poor in Latin America 
that made no difference either. She got 16 percent, the same as Barack Obama in his second election. And yet evangelical leaders like Franklin Graham, I'll pass that one up, we'll come back to that one, like Franklin Graham, also the son of a famous pastor, in this case uh, Billy Graham, Billy Graham's son, uh, Franklin Graham asserted that God was moving in the election. So I'm going to show you just a short clip of an interview with Franklin Graham on an American news program. No. So here is Franklin Graham talking about the result of the election. Uh, they came by the hundreds and thousands and they stood on their capital steps and they prayed. They didn't come to hear me speak. They came to pray. Uh, for this nation because they knew the country was going the wrong direction. And I, and I could tell as I was going across this country that God was getting ready to do something in this country. Uh, they were praying that God would change the direction that our nation was going. And the, the secularist uh, that had gotten uh, control of Washington, uh, that had a humanistic, uh, atheistic agenda, uh, they were they were praying that God would change this and, and put somebody in the White House uh, that uh, believed in God and were willing to listen to God's voice. And I believe this election, no question, I believe God's hand was in it. Yes, some powerful words. So God's hand was in it was the conclusion of Reverend Franklin Graham. So we're confronted with a question, what explains why evangelicals vote for a candidate who is clearly ignorant of most of the basic doctrines of Christianity, who has very little familiarity with evangelicals, who has no history uh, promoting the kinds of issues such as abortion, because he had originally been in favor of abortion rights. Uh, he seemed to be sympathetic to LGBTQ rights and certainly had come out in favor of gay marriage. So why was it that more than any candidate, even more than George W. Bush, did evangelicals support him? That's one question that scholars and especially journalists have been asking. But I think what's more interesting is the kind of fractures and issues within the community that that number is hiding that that number is hiding. I want to focus on some of the reasons why I think that that number is actually not really very helpful in understanding evangelical voters in the, in the coming years. So I want to focus on three areas to try to help us through. One is to define what do we mean when we're talking about evangelical voters and then to explore some of the reasons of their support, and then to look at some of the new directions of the religious right and of uh, the religious left as well. So uh, first we have to define what we mean by an evangelical voter, because the term itself is not quite as obvious as it might initially seem. Now, According to a very, uh, very easy to understand chart created here by the Pew Research Center, which does extensive research on contemporary American religion, if we imagined that the United States had 100 people living in it, this is what the population would look like. You would have 25 evangelical Protestants, you would have 15 mainline Protestants and six historically black Protestants, 21 Catholics two Mormons, other Christians, which means many of the Pentecostal denominations and the smaller groups, two Jews, one Muslim, one Hindu, a Buddhist, two of other faiths, and then 23 who uh, scholars often call the nuns, N-O-N-E, that is people who do not say I belong to any church or belong to any religious group. So this gives us a sense, first of all, of the power of the Christian majority in the United States, but it's a majority that has been declining. Uh, this group right here is the fastest group in America, fastest growing group in America, the nuns, the people who do not claim to have any religious affiliation. Now, uh, if we look at the religious makeup of here, we see white born-again evangelical Christians 
have been steady around 26% of the voting population. 26% of the voting population. So they form an extremely important voting group for anybody who wants to be president of the United States. All right. So we would assume, therefore, that this would be very important in the last election. But when pollsters asked evangelical voters what is the most important issue, did they say the Supreme Court, abortion, gay rights? No, they said the economy, national security, personal character, Supreme Court is the first time. Protect religious freedom. This is, again, this idea of if, it, if the government requires same-sex marriage, can it force people to churches to host same-sex marriages? So abortion, 4%. So on the, while we might think, oh, evangelical voters all voted on their top issues, really, they were voting on the economy. So part of the problem is that it's hard to understand them as voting only as religious voters. They're voting more than just as religious voters. So defining an evangelical voter is not as easy as it might seem. We could ask if they, this is what pollsters do. Are you an evangelical? You define it. But the problem is that if we look at the support for evangelical causes, they often fall outside of the evangelical community. Catholics, Mormons, some uh, parts of the uh, uh, Pentecostal traditions also favor the same kinds of issues as white evangelicals. But they're not evangelicals. So when Pence calls himself an evangelical Catholic, he calls himself an evangelical Catholic, the polling data doesn't put him in there because he's a Catholic. He'll be counted as a Catholic. Mormons also supported Trump. And here we can go back to our slide that I skipped by. If we look here at the presidential election results here, we see Catholic here, broadly, 50%. Uh, so they're splitting relatively easy across here. But by the time we get to Trump, it's 52-45. But if you look here at white Catholic, it's 60 to 37, and it flips almost when you turn it to Hispanic Catholic. So what am I trying to say? I'm trying to say, therefore, that another thing we need to be aware of is the racial component of evangelical Christianity. Evangelical as a term, the way in which pollsters use it, usually means white evangelicals, but does not say so. It usually puts African Americans into an African American affiliated denomination category. So black evangelicals are usually not counted when you count evangelical vote. So if you look here, you will see this figure from 2007. Among evangelicals who define themselves as evangelicals, 81% are white. And then we have a mixture here of black, Asian, Latino. But if you see from 2007 to 2014, the percentage of evangelicals who are white is declining. The fastest growing group is Latinos and Asians are the fastest growing populations of evangelical voters in the United States. So the figure 81% is really a figure that says 81% of white evangelicals voted for Donald Trump. But it doesn't say what did Asian and Hispanic evangelical and African American evangelical voters do. So here we get a sense of that. When asked, this is before the vote, when asked, who are you going to vote for? White evangelicals, 65% uh, are voting uh, for Donald Trump, and but 62% of non-white evangelicals are voting for Hillary Clinton. 
So again, we have to understand that much of the data we get often just says evangelical voters, but it doesn't point out that that is white evangelical voters. African Americans, Hispanic, and Asian American evangelicals are voting more likely as Democrats. So that's one thing we need to keep in mind. So I want to move on uh, to talk about some of the cracks in the consensus among even white evangelicals. So on the one hand, evangelicals, white evangelicals who supported Donald Trump are thrilled with Donald Trump. Since taking office, he has aggressively rewarded his evangelical base. Earlier this month, for example, he signed an executive order related to what's known as the Johnson Amendment, and this is just simply a, uh, a, a, a law, a congressional law that restricts ministers from directly saying, vote for Donald Trump, because they have tax-free status as a church organization. They are forbidden from saying, vote for Jim or vote for Hillary. Uh, and he was trying to chip away at this idea that people could directly endorse political candidates. He also nominated Neil Gorsuch for the United States Supreme Court, widely assumed to be opposed to abortion and therefore a sure vote to try to overcome the Roe versus Wade. Conservative evangelicals were extremely happy with that. In January, Vice President Mike Pence appeared at the Rally for Life, a pro-life or anti-abortion rally in Washington. He was the highest ranking government official to ever be at the rally in person, giving again a kind of reward to the evangelical base. Uh, Trump also provide, reinstated a George W. Bush era executive order that banned international family planning and health groups from distributing condoms or recommending abortion as one possible health choice. And shortly after taking office, Trump gave one of his first major interviews to the Christian Broadcast Network. This was his first interview as president, in which he assured the viewers of the Christian Broadcast Network that his travel ban, banning Islam, banning Muslims from coming in, would not discriminate against Syrian Christians. And he made very clear that he believed that Syrian Christians and Christians had been badly treated and they would be given preference over Muslim immigrants or uh, refugees. Uh, he then gave his first presidential address, uh, his first uh, commencement address, graduation speech at Liberty University, the place that Jerry Falwell uh, uh, that had founded and his son was so helpful in getting, uh, Jerry Falwell Jr. was so helpful in getting Trump's election. Uh, he had a very bizarre appearance at the National Prayer Breakfast in which he asked in, uh, for the prayer was to ask that the host of the Apprentice television show uh, would get better ratings. Uh, so as Jerry Falwell Jr., from Liberty University, he summed it up. He said, it's a happy group of people right now. It's a happy group of people right now in the few weeks after the election. However, not everyone is happy. And some of the troubles began quite early. So evangelicals actually did not like Trump during the election process. Before selecting Donald Trump, they actually preferred two other candidates. One of them was the retired neurosurgeon, Ben Carson, and the other was the son of a Baptist minister, uh, Ted Cruz, the senator from Texas. These were the two preferred evangelical candidates. They did not like Trump, and polling data from the time shows that when asked among presidential candidates, Trump seen as least religious by overall voters here, even Bernie Sanders had people believed he was more religious than Donald Trump was. Uh, and among, among Republicans, that was the previous slide, this is voters, American voters, and this is among Republicans, 
they clearly said that they believed that Ben Carson and Ted Cruz were very or somewhat religious, 80, 76 percent, but Donald Trump only got 44 percent of voters to say he was either very or somewhat religious. So evangelical voters did not like Donald Trump at the beginning of the selection process, but as it came down, they were left with Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton, and they were concerned uh, and believed that Hillary Clinton would be too disastrous. Now, when Jerry Falwell Jr. went out to campaign to say that God wanted Donald Trump to be president, a group of students began to protest at Liberty College, at Liberty University, Evangelical University. One recent graduate returned his diploma. He said, I used to be proud of being a Liberty graduate. I no longer feel that way. I'm returning my diploma. And uh, more than 2,000 student, students and faculty signed a manifesto called Liberty United Against Trump, which argued that, quote, not only is Donald Trump a bad candidate for president, he is actively promoting the very things that we as Christians ought to oppose. While everyone is a sinner and everyone can be forgiven, they continued, a man who constantly and proudly speaks evil and does not deserve our support for the nation's highest office. Falwell responded by insisting that he was speaking as a private citizen, and not as the president of Liberty University. But students and faculty at Liberty feared that most people would not see a difference between Falwell and the university and would think that Liberty University was endorsing Donald Trump. Trump has also strained the long alliance that has been made between evangelical Protestants and Roman Catholics. You may have seen in the news that President Trump was just in the Vatican yesterday. Uh, there was a time when it was not even clear whether or not this meeting was going to happen. The president did not ask for it at first, and the pope did not request it either. Uh, pope Francis has been a critic of, if not Donald Trump, then at least some of his positions. And again, this was taken just yesterday. People who support the Trump, uh, who support the Pope, sort of uh, criticism of Donald Trump have sort of made fun with these two images, where the Pope looks like he's just gamma, <laughs> and here, and then contrasting it with Obama and the and uh, the Pope, where they seem to get along very well. So this has become a kind of internet meme where people are making fun of of Trump, that the Pope hates Trump and is just sort of having to deal with him. So. Uh, there was a major blow-up between the Pope and Donald Trump during the presidential election, and uh, somebody on Twitter has put together a kind of useful what did the Pope say and what did Trump say, so I'm just going to show a quick video of that. Let's see. So first here is the Pope speaking about Donald Trump's belief in putting a wall between Mexico and the United States, uh, and then what does Donald Trump say in response to the Pope's particular ideas? Una persona que pensa soltanto in fare muri, sia dopo sia, e non fare ponti, non è cristiano. Questo non è nel Vangelo. So I guess this is a little bit for the press, so I just wrote this out very quickly about the Pope. Do you want to hear it? Should I read it to you? Okay. He actually said that maybe I'm not a good Christian or something. It's unbelievable, which is really not a nice thing to say. So it's a response from Donald Trump. If and when the Vatican is attacked by ISIS, which, as everyone knows, is ISIS's ultimate trophy, I can promise you that the Pope would have only wished and prayed that Donald Trump would have been president. 
because it's true. It's true. Okay. It's true. Okay. <laughs> so Trump has put a strain. Uh, the, the Trump's kind of war of words with the Pope has put a strain upon a long uh, association with Catholics, conservative Catholics, particularly white conservative Catholics and white evangelicals uh, when Pope Francis has forcefully challenged Trump's position. So conservative Catholics feel like their pope is against them. As a matter of fact, uh, Steve Bannon, the chief White House political advisor, very Catholic, very conservative, did not go to the Vatican to meet the pope as a kind of protest, I guess. I, I just saw, but I haven't read more about it. But, um, but the controversy also reveals a growing racial and ideological divide within American Catholicism. So if we look back at this where we uh, were earlier, this is critical, this difference of support between white and Hispanic Catholics is, is growing quite dramatic now, uh, particularly related to the immigration issue. Hispanic Catholics, while they are supportive of some evangelical things such as same-sex marriage opposition and abortion, Trump's position on immigrants, particularly Mexican immigrants, and his position on, uh, on uh, getting these illegal or uh, uh, these uh, illegal immigrants out of the country has put a strain on Hispanic Catholics who have been voting against uh, the white evangelical party. So 60% of white Catholics voted for Trump. 67% of Hispanic Catholics voted for Hillary Clinton. So this division doesn't just threat Catholic political unity, but cooperation with white evangelical Protestants as well, who can no longer feel that the Pope is a reliable ally in their particular political struggles. And some other divisions have popped up as well. So in March of this year, the Trump administration released a proposal for a budget which had breathtaking cuts in humanitarian aid and developmental aid programs for countries abroad and domestic programs that assisted the poor, the elderly, and the disabled. And a group of evangelical pastors objected and in an open letter signed by over 50 of them to Congress, they reminded leaders that Jesus preached that, quote, when we serve the least of these, we are serving the Lord. As people of faith, we cannot turn our back on those in desperate need, unquote. As followers of Christ, it is our moral responsibility to urge you to support and protect the poor. At the same time, Trump's hardline position on Syrian refugees and his desire to deport undocumented immigrants has troubled the conscience of non-white evangelical congregations. Sam Rodriguez was the pastor at Trump's inauguration, gave the opening prayer, and now is in opposition to Trump's position on uh, the uh, exp the, the, the deportation of undocumented Hispanic immigrants. An even more striking split has emerged in the Southern Baptist Convention in which I was raised. If we see the white evangelical, the heart of white evangelicals is the American South. Here is the map showing the concentration of where you find the greatest number of white Southern Baptists. Not surprisingly, these are all red, red Republican states, consistently Republican states. So America's largest evangelical group, the Southern Baptist Convention, is central to the coalition 
of evangelical voters. And yet, during the election, Russell Moore, a pastor, wrote an op-ed in the New York Times, an editorial in the New York Times, shortly before Trump became the Republican nominee. And he warned evangelicals that in supporting Trump, quote, we must repudiate everything we believe. Three months later, Moore followed this with an extended reflection, quite eloquent, titled, titled Can the Religious Right Be Saved? Can the Religious Right Be Saved? Moore was uneasy with this kind of cultural Christianity, he called it, that was divorced from the Bible, that was more focused on politics than on God. The evangelicals' right, the evangelical right was hypocritical in supporting Trump, he said. And this damaged America, but worse, it damaged Christ's message. The religious right turns out to be the people the religious right warned us about. He said, he pointed out that young conservative evangelicals were abandoning politics, disgusted with a Christianity focused on winning elections and not winning souls. A next generation religious conservative needs an evangelical wing committed to the gospel itself. Committed to the gospel itself, he said. And he warned that right-wing politics and a thirst, a desire for political power and political influence had overtaken a focus on scripture. He called instead for a, quote, religious conservatism that sees the church as more important than the state, the conscience as more important than the culture, and one that knows the difference between the temporal and the eternal. These kinds of statements got Moore into a huge amount of trouble with the Southern Baptist leadership. Many churches within the convention threatened to leave the Southern Baptist Convention unless Moore was thrown out of his leadership position within the group. However, Moore is extremely popular with younger Southern Baptist evangelicals and non-white evangelicals because he has pushed very dramatically to understand and to recognize the position of non-whites within the movement. So he has a very strong base of support in the next generation of evangelicals. And as a result, he refused to back down. He apologized for being, quote unquote, unnecessarily harsh. But he did not retract anything he said. And eventually, the Southern Baptist Convention decided to leave him alone. Now, there have been other strains of strain as well. In February, Baptists in Puerto Rico withdrew their support for Franklin Graham to come to give a revival. They withdrew their support, saying that his divisive rhetoric and his stand against immigration was against the gospel. And students, uh, just a, about a week ago at the Catholic University called Notre Dame, a group of students walked out when Vice President Mike Pence gave the graduation speech. A few days before that, at an evangelical college called Grove City College, students and community activists also protested Mike Pence's presence at the college and his uh, giving of a graduation speech. Trump's election has also provided a great deal of energy to what we might call the religious left. I think probably we're all familiar with the religious right, but the religious left has found itself with new energy, a loose coalition of liberal, mainline Protestants, evangelicals, and Catholics. And probably uh, the most eloquent voice on the religious left is a North Carolina Baptist preacher, William Barber, extraordinary individual, great, fine man. 
He uh, gained his fame in North Carolina by leading a series of what were called Moral Monday Marches. Moral Monday Marches. After the election of a hard right government in North Carolina, Reverend Barber organized many different coalitions of groups to march on the Capitol, Raleigh, North Carolina, in a moral protest against cuts for programs for the poor, the lack of access to abortion rights, and so on and so forth. The last moral uh, Monday march was in February, and 80,000 people came to this march. So I want to, in the last little bit, show you just a small portion. He was featured at the Democratic National Convention. Hillary Clinton invited him to give a speech, and he gave a speech, and I want to show you a part of it, just a small, about three and a half minutes long. But what's critical is the way he introduces himself as a conservative evangelical. So let's take a listen to what he has to say. My brothers and sisters, I come before you tonight as a preacher, a son of a preacher, a preacher immersed in the movement at five years old. I don't come tonight representing any organization, but I come to talk about faith and morality. I'm a preacher and I'm a theologically conservative liberal evangelical biblicist. I know it may sound strange, but I'm a conservative because I work to conserve a divine tradition that teaches us to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with our God. I've had the privilege of traveling the country with the Reverend Dr. James Forbes and Reverend Dr. Tracy Blackman and Sister Simone Campbell. As we are working together in the revival and calling for a moral revolution of values. And as we travel the country and we see some things, that's why I'm so concerned about those that say so much about what God says so little while saying so little about what God says so much. And so in my heart, I'm troubled and I'm worried by the way faith is cynically used by some to serve hate, fear, racism, and greed. We need to heed the voice of the scriptures. We need to listen to the ancient chorus in which deep calls unto deep. The prophet Isaiah cries out, what I'm interested in seeing you doing, says the Lord as a nation is, pay people what they deserve. Share your food with the hungry. Do this and then your nation shall be called a repairer of the breach. Jesus, Jesus, a brown-skinned Palestinian Jew, called us, called us to preach good news to the poor, the broken, and the bruised, and all those who were made to feel unaccepted. Our Constitution calls us to commit our government to establish justice, to promote the general welfare, to provide for the common defense, and to ensure domestic tranquility. Now, to be true, we have never lived this vision perfectly, but this ought to be the goal at the heart of our democracy. And when religion is used to camouflage meanness, we know that we have a heart problem in America. There, 
There have always been forces that wanted to harden, even stop the heart of our democracy. But there have also always been people who stood together to stir what Sister Dorothy Day called a revolution of the heart and what Dr. King called a radical revolution of values. So what's significant here is that the Democratic Convention made a very clear attempt to reach evangelical voters. It did not just let the language of the church be owned by the right wing. They invited a number of preachers, of which Barber was one, and here he makes a call for an interpretation of scripture that is not focused on abortion, homosexuality, and other issues of sex, but instead on what he sees as the central themes of Christ's ministry to the poor, to the broken, to the needy, and doing so without shame on behalf of a democratic candidate. So this suggests the possibility of an energized religious left made up of evangelicals as well. So let me just say in final, as to conclude, that Donald Trump's presidency is putting extraordinarily large strains on the evangelical movement right at the moment of perhaps its biggest triumph. The evangelical consensus centered on abortion and homosexuality and religious expression in public life. And by religious expression in public life, they mean Christian expression, not religious, but Christian expression in public life. That consensus may be, may be breaking down. Evangelicals loved Donald Trump at the polls in November, but their support has hid divisions that are now emerging as the Trump administration moves to making policy. Particularly, the enormous number of Hispanic evangelicals and Catholics challenges the assumption that equates evangelicals with whites and evangelicals with Republicans. Trump's deportation policies have strained cooperation between Hispanic and non-Hispanic evangelicals and between Catholics and evangelicals. And a new generation of conservatives like Russell Moore argue that the long obsession with homosexuality and abortion have distracted from Christ's ministry. As one great scholar of evangelicalism writes, if when people hear evangelical, they think of something political first, then the serious meaning of the word is gone. That is, evangelical is about Christ, not about politics. So there are some strains in the coalition, whether they will actually break down or break along new lines is unclear right now and how much influence the evangelical left, the Christian left, will have in building religious opposition to Trump's administration is still unclear, but it is particularly striking. So, I would like to end here. どうもあのキャンベル先生ありがとうございましたこれからあの質疑応答に移りたいと思いますがあの英語で、えー、あの質疑応答もいいんですけどあの日本語でも構いませんがあのできるだけ英語でお願いしたいと思います Thank you for your present Thank you for your speech That was really impressive I just have a question about、um, uh, differences in voters between who people who graduated from Uh, university or and those people who didn't enter、um, university or even just ended at the elementary, not elementary,、mm-hmm. sec- secondary elementary school. So, how do you see those kind of、um, um, divergence between educated people and those who are not such educated? Okay,、uh, this takes up with a famous quotation that.、Um, 
Donald Trump made during the primary in which he said, I love the poorly educated uh, because they had formed part of his coalition. Uh, and so because of that, some people have assumed, I don't have the statistics right here, but some people have assumed that it was just because people were poorly educated that meant they supported Trump. Uh, but in fact, uh, college graduates also, Republican college graduates supported Trump as well. So there was no necessary direct line between the level of education one had and one's uh, voting. It tended to break much more along what party did you belong to? Uh, so we can't just sort of say, well, the poorly educated, they don't really, they're not so smart or they don't have enough information, so that's why they voted for Trump. College graduates also voted for Trump as well. Thank you very much, Professor. I'm particularly interested in the, the Donald Trump's policy to decrease the official development assistance and mm -hmm. the humanitarian assistance to the other country. And I wonder if there is any international or regional alliance movement of the evangelicals in, in the other countries like Latin America or the Africa or the Southeast Asia who are the recipient of the, the American aid. Yes, so that's an excellent question. Uh, often uh, there is direct uh, aid going between congregations within denominations across national borders that is not part of U.S. aid. So yes, so that's certainly part of it. But U.S. aid also forms an important part. So uh, that's why they have been lobbying for continuing that developmental aid. Uh, part of it also is not so oftentimes the congregation to congregation or denomination to denomination aid is focused on the church's work, whereas development aid uh, helps provide small loans for farmers or provides infrastructure. So this is beyond what churches can do on their own. So as a result, they need, they, you know, for development, they need sources outside of individual congregations or denominational funding. So that's why they're trying to still lobby to provide uh, funds. And it's also partly the principle as well that you know this is simply something that as a Christian, one has a kind of responsibility to do. I don't know if does that answer your question? OK. Campbell, thank you very much. Evangelical world, あの私日本語で質問しますから英語で答えてください。頑張ります。はい、<笑>あのエヴァンジェリカルの中でダイバーシティがあるっていう、うん、あの紹介とても興味深かった深かったんですけど、でもそれはもう選挙あのオバマの時からあったと思うんですね。例えばそのレリジアスレフトだとかあるいはリベラルエヴァンジェリカルズと言われる人たちはあのアボーションの問題だとか。あるいはそのゲイの問題よりももっと地球の温暖化の問題だとかあるいは世界のフォーアティの問題の方がより重要だというふうに考えるグループはあったと思うんですところが今回の選挙で結果的にはエヴァンジェリカルの 81% の人がトランプに投票した 25% の人口の 25% のエヴァンジェリカルの 81% が投票したことによってやっぱりトランプが勝ったんだと思うんですね。でそういう意味ではあのやっぱりそのレジャス・ライトあるいはあのホワイト・エヴァンジェリカルズかトランプを勝たせたと思うんですもしこれが 80% じゃなくて 50%50% ,50 だったらトランプ勝てないと思いますよでどうしてそのおアメリカのエヴァンジェリカルの中で、えー、ゲイだとかアボーションの問題がヒューマン・ライツだとかあるいはポバティの問題よりもより重要だと考えるのかそれから次の選挙の時までにそのエヴァンジェリカルズの中にその変化が起こって例えば 80% じゃなくて 50%50% というような状態が生まれてくるっていうふうに先生は予測されるのかそれともやっぱり今回と同じような結果になるんじゃないかと予測,予測するのかその辺はどうですか、はいありがとうございますこれあのバックしたらえっ、ー、とこれを見るとこれがイヴァンジェリカの音合わせなんですそのイヴァンジェリカの人たちが経済的な問題が第一です宗教よりその経済の問題が第一ですだから
そのイヴァンジェルコルが 81% だけれどもイヴァンジェルコを通して投票されたかと分からないですねそれがもうこれが26と22プラス15だからこれがよく言われたんですけれども最,最高裁判所がこれからどうなるかとだからもうクリントンは大統領になってしまうともう最悪なことになるとかそれがよく言われたんですけれどもでもイヴァンジェルコの人たちに問い合わせたらこれが1234番目になったんですだからなぜかと。宗教的なことが抑えてそれよりもこれが重要だと思うナショナルセキュリティとえっ、ー、とエコノミーでもおっしゃった通りにもう 80% がすごく目立っているんですねだからこれからどうになるかと私はもしかしてトランプ大統領になったがもりとなんかレイモンショックがあるんじゃないですかでもこれはトランプショックだと思うんですみんながもう大変びっくりトランプもびっくりして自分自身もトランプもびっくりしましただからえっ、ー、とそのリリジュス・レフトとかそのサザン・バプティスの中でもそのラスロ・ムーアがすごく偉いの仕事を持っているんです彼も自信を持ってすごく批判してニューヨーク・タイムズでもあの割と意見を広がったんです結果的にはやっぱりまたリパブリカンを応援してしまうただこれが種になったかなとわからないですないかもしれないですけれども、うん、でもなったらいいんじゃないかなと私のまあ個人の意見ですけれどもあのでも変化がないかもしれないですね変化がないかもしれないです特にそのあの今最近そのデモクラットとリパブリカンがすごくすごく固まっていてだからそれが宗教よりも何のことでもまあリパブリカンだから応援しますだからみんながその先にあのあの紹介したんですけれどもあのリパブリカンの中ではトランプは信仰を持っているじゃないでしょうと思った。ただもう彼にしますこれしかないですもうだからしょうがないというようなことですけれどもだからえっ、ー、と4年後ではどうになるか<笑>ちょっとわからないですねでもあのまあキープホープライフというか<笑>チェック Thank you very much I have a question on Johnson's amendment Um, if Trump's effort to repeal the Johnson's Amendment is to gain more support from the evangelical group, which is the largest religious community in the nation, speaking of long termism, when we see your、um, popular prediction that actually the nuns are the fastest growing、um, population in the country, do you think the administration simply i g n o r e this prediction? or Do you think this is actually a, a move to prevent the,、uh, America to be less Christian as it is right now? So, the Johnson Amendment、uh, was a 1965 law passed uh, uh, under uh, uh, Lyndon Johnson, which said that if you have tax exempt status, you could not advocate for a political. Official, you could not say if you were an NPO or an NGO, vote for Jones. And this meant because churches are tax exempt, they would not be allowed to say vote for Donald Trump. They could provide what's called voter guidance, that is, they'll hand out pamphlets showing this is what Trump says about abortion, this is what Hillary Clinton says about abortion. You decide. It's obvious what the church is encouraging you to do, but they can't strictly say vote for a particular candidate. So, evangelicals believe that this is a restriction on their free speech rights. They want to be able to say, as a Christian, you need to vote for so and so. So, they have been lobbying to get rid of the Johnson Amendment. During the campaign, Donald Trump said he would do that. One of the first things he'd do would repeal the. 
However, his decision actually did not repeal the amendment. It was, uh, it simply told the IRS that we give you the choice to pursue or not pursue if you find an example where a preacher has said, voted for Donald Trump. You can decide as the IRS to just ignore that. This was a tremendous disappointment to the evangelical community. They believed that they had supported Trump because he was going to get rid of the amendment, but he didn't. And so many evangelical groups were very, very upset. They said it was, as Dr. Modi said, it was because of us you got elected, so you better do what we, have, what we say. So what makes Trump unusual is that his is a presidency focused on satisfying his base, the people that elected him. As long as he, he feels, as long as he can keep them happy, he will be able to govern. So he doesn't care about the nuns because they didn't vote for him anyway. So his job is to make his group as happy as possible. And yet, he struggled to do that even as well. So the Johnson Amendment had turned out to be something he thought he was going to get credit for. It turned out the uh, leaders of the evangelical movement were very upset because they didn't think he went far enough to defend their religious liberty or their right to speak. Uh, thank you very much for a very, very interesting presentation. And I personally had actually, uh, to be very honest with you, I had a very biased view of the uh, evangelical Christians. I thought that they have more, uh, more, more uh, they are uh, very conservative, and uh, uh, they, I thought that they had a, basically uh, almost the same views on most of the uh, political issues. But uh, you taught us today, um, it is very interesting for me to learn that actually there are diversities among the evangelicals. Mm -hmm. And I have a more um, fundamental question. Mm -hmm. um, what is the, the, uh, the clear definition of what evangelicals are? <laughs> I'm not really clear about. Um, I heard that there are hundreds of the uh, denominations of, among the, uh, the Protestant uh, Christians in, in the United States, but how are they distinguished from the uh, um, other uh, denominations? Okay, well, that's a superb question. Uh, that's an excellent question because, of course, that's what, part of what I was trying to say was that the problem is you don't, we have to define what it is we're talking about. We just sort of throw out evangelical voters and like you, many Americans have a sort of set mind of a white, sort of fat, southern, older, conservative person when they imagine evangelical Christian, the sort of Jerry Falwell just sort of pops into their mind. So uh, what I was trying to suggest was that term does apply to that group, but there are also others within that. But then, of course, we're asking, so what is an evangelical? What makes evangelical Christianity different from other branches of the Christian faith. And that is a fundamental question because evangelical Christianity is the dominant branch of Christianity in the United States. So, thinking that somebody just might ask that, <laughs> I prepared some slides <laughs> about what is an evangelical. Now, scholars, Uh, this is another group I didn't talk about, we didn't have time, but it's called the Red Letter Christians. Uh, if you see an English Bible, oftentimes you'll find a portion where, God, where Jesus speaks in the gospel, and those, letter, those words are written in red. So the Red Letter Christian movement is a conservative, evangelical movement that says, well, let's pay attention to what Christ says, not let's worry about politics. Let's get back to the Bible. So they're conservative. They don't support gay rights. They don't support uh, gay marriage. They don't support abortion. But they also are very left on social issues like poverty reduction uh, and things like that. So this is another group that's quite interesting. But uh, da -da -da. so. Scholars themselves have a lot of discussion about what do you do with this category called evangelical. But generally, scholars can agree that there's sort of a sev several four major things that make somebody an evangelical as opposed to what we call mainline Protestant. So one of them is the conversion. So the notion that all people are born as sinners who must be radically transformed through the process of what is called being born again. 
famous section of the scripture in which Nicodemus asks Christ how he can get into heaven and he is told that he must be born again in which he then replies, well, how can I be born two times? Am I supposed to crawl back inside my mother? And Christ says, no, you are born once in the flesh and once in the spirit. So evangelicals argue that there must be a second birth in which one is one commits oneself to Christ, following Christ's message. So this, in evangelical belief, means that even after you have gone through this rebirth or second birth does not mean you are going to heaven for sure because people go back, they get worse, they backslide in the way in which it's described in English. So one thing is this a central focus on the act of conversion, a conscious decision to accept Jesus Christ's teaching. If you're a Catholic, you're born a Catholic, you get baptized, you are too small to agree or disagree, you just get baptized. There's no, nothing of that comes out of you, but this is a direct encounter and a decision. Secondly, uh, they uh, believe in a kind of activism, putting God's words and wisdom into practice in the world. So, to be an evangelical is not to just sit there and pat yourself on the head and say, aren't I great? It is to take Christ's message out into the world, and that can be by saying, do you know Jesus Christ? Let me introduce you to Jesus Christ. The act of evangelizing, bringing the good news. But it also can be working on behalf of the poor, providing food, providing shelter. That is, taking Christ's message, not just for oneself, but as a message that needs to be spread throughout the world. Not only conversion, but also bringing Christ's life into the life of the world. Third, it is heavily Christ-centered rather than God-centered. It is centered on Christ's actions, his teachings, his, his sacrifices. So if you ever see an American baseball game or football game, there's somebody usually holding a sign, John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that we may have everlasting life, centered on Christ's presence. So this notion of it emphasizes the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross which makes possible the redemption of all people. So in addition, Christ is active in your daily life. You talk to Christ. Christ talks to you. You ask Christ how you should do things, what you should do by prayer, by reflection, by talking. So Christ is an active presence. God is, may feel far off away in the sky somewhere, silent, but Christ is in your life on a daily basis. Fourth, it is Bible-centered. Well, you say, well, it's Christians, of course it's Bible-centered, but some traditions are not. That is, the Catholic tradition, for example, has many, many commentaries on the Bible in which the works of Thomas Aquinas are part of understanding the works of the popes. Their commentaries are part of the tradition of interpreting. But this is Bible-centered, and it says we don't need anybody to read the Bible to us. We do not need anybody to read the Bible for us. The Bible is a book that is open to anyone and everyone to understand. So, you pick it up. If you want to know what does Christ want us to do, what does God call us to do, you open the Bible. You read the Bible, and the Bible will tell you. It is God's message. It is God's words to you as an individual and us as a people. Some think that it is, quote, infallible. That is, it has no errors in it whatsoever. Many evangelicals believe it is infallible. No mistakes. There are no errors. But you would point out, well, what about <laughs> there's a contradiction here with this? Well, that is because your understanding is not sufficient, is not complete. God makes no mistakes. So, uh, and as I said here, finally, it is open to everyone to read. It does not require a priestly class. It's 
to interpret it for us. It is God speaking directly to us. So uh, the last of the things that generally brings evangelicals together, despite some of the differences, is an emphasis on the second coming of Christ and the end of time. Jesus will return to the earth again and rule for a thousand years, and God will judge all souls for hell or heaven. And there's a tremendous amount of disagreement on whether Christ comes first or the, 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 the decision, you know, the, 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 the reign of horrors starts first, post-millennial, pre-millennial, very complex theology, but a certainty that Christ will return again bodily and he will take part in the judging of every soul that has lived, whether that person will go to heaven or to hell. So those are sort of five general things that unite evangelical Christians in various portions. So evangelical Christianity is not a denomination. It is an approach to the Christian message. So there are evangelical Catholics. There are evangelical Protestants. There are evangelical mainline Protestants, evangelical Mormons, evangelical Presbyterians, evangelical Lutherans. So even the groups called mainline Protestants have evangelical wings within them. So it's kind of an approach to Christ's message that takes advantage of these five sort of themes to try to bring Christ into their own life and into the life of the community around them. So that's sort of how we can see what makes evangelicalism different from other kinds of Christianity. Uh, thank you very much for an excellent explanation. Uh, everything was clear to me now, and uh, I understand how uh, Trump doesn't fit into one any of these categories <laughs> you just mentioned. So is it that the um, um, evangelical Christians voted for Trump just because he's better than Clinton? Is that the, uh, probably the only reason the evangelical uh, people decided to vote for Trump, who doesn't really fit into any of these categories you just mentioned? Uh, the political science research suggests that currently the most, important, the most important factor to determine a vote is one's party affiliation, one's party belonging. That's the central thing. More than religion, more than gender, more than education, more than region. It is party affiliation. So currently, what party you belong to is the most important factor in trying to judge whether somebody's going to vote Democratic or Republican. So part of what I think is going on with this data is that much of the white evangelical vote is already Republican. They're not independent, they're not Democrat, so their vote for Donald Trump is because they're as a Republican, not as a Christian, not as an evangelical, but as a Republican. Uh, because, as I showed earlier, even Republicans didn't really think Donald Trump was a religious figure, and I think everybody knew that his trying to reach out to evangelical voters was just pure politics. I don't think anybody was really fooled by it. A lot of Evangelical leaders like Falwell and others tried to sort of paper it over, but it was so obvious that. So I think part of it is that party loyalty is extremely powerful right now in the United States. And since uh, many people who are evangelical are also Republican, it's hard to know, did they vote as a Christian or did they vote as a Republican? And the evidence seems to suggest they voted as a Republican first.